Hi, I'm Dr. Ever Matthews. I'm here to do part two of the two-part skeletal muscle lecture. And on part one, we covered a brief overview of just sort of skeletal muscle and how it functions, why we use it, why we have it, as well as fiber types. So if you haven't watched that yet, please go back and watch that video. In this video, we're going to be talking about some of the um, microscopic anatomy, as well as how the muscle cells actually contract and cause uh, muscle movement and bodily movements. All right, so starting here with the the bone on the left hand side uh, and the tendon that is uh, sort of integrated into the bone as well as into the muscle. Right, around the muscle as well as within the muscle you have fascia. Fascia is just connective tissue that kind of holds everything together and it also is what comes together to create the tendon at the end of the muscle. All right, so around the muscle itself, so this here represents the entire muscle, around the outside of the muscle that fascia is called the epimecium. Right. Then within the epime or well, within the muscle, we have these muscle fascicles, which are just bundles of muscle cells or muscle fibers. So again, fibers, muscle fibers, and muscle cells, same thing. Um, and these bundles, so these fascicles, are surrounded by a paramecium. So it's another uh, inner layer of the fascia. You can also see here that the um, the alpha motor neuron, which we'll talk about more in a, a couple slides, uh, is going to be in this uh, level of uh, the anatomy. And you're also going to see the capillaries which supply the, the blood. So the next unit down is where you're going to get to the individual muscle cell. And so we have the endomecium, which is the fascia that surrounds the actual muscle cells themselves. All right. So if you look at this level here, so again, this is a single muscle cell or muscle fiber. And we have the sarcoplasmic reticulum shown here as this sort of yellow weaving uh, type organelle um, that surrounds the muscle cell. We have the nuclei here, which is where all the genetic material inside the cell is located. And in the in a skeletal muscle, it happens to get kind of pushed to the outside, so that's why we can see it. And we also have a satellite cell here, which we'll talk more about in a future uh, slide here. Um, that is something that becomes a nucleus. All right, so we are done now with the fascia. So again, we have the epimecium around the, the whole muscle, the paramecium around a muscle fascicle, and we have the endomecium around a single muscle cell. All right. We also, though, around a muscle cell have the cell membrane, which is called in a muscle cell the sarcolemma. All right, the sarcolemma is what the electrical impulse that travels down, so the action potential travels down and right before it gets into the cell and causes um, muscle contraction, which we'll talk about. Within the muscle cell, if we break it down to another smaller unit, we have myofibrils, and these myofibrils are made up of myofilaments. All right, so um, myofilaments are basically the individual proteins that make up the muscle. The two big ones that we're going to talk most about that are most important are the actin, this purple, and the, my uh, the myosin, the uh, green here. All right, so those two are what interact together in order to cause muscle contraction. All right, and so if you were to zoom out a little bit on this, um, so uh, on the these myofibrils, uh, you would see striation. So this is an actual electron micrograph of um, a skeletal muscle and so you can see here this sort of these band like structures that are going to be created by the different ways the myosin and the actin are overlapping with each other and we'll talk about that uh, here in a minute or so too all right but this is a basic overview of how the skeletal muscle is structured so inside the actual muscle cell, right against the um, sarcolemma, um, but on the inside, we have the nuclei. Again, this is where all the genetic materials stored. And then if we look outside the cell, we have satellite cells. They look about the same because they're essentially the same. The satellite cell will eventually become a nucleus. All right, so satellite cells are very important for muscle growth, um, which is typically muscle hypertrophy. Um, so hypertrophy meaning the muscle cell getting bigger. And they're also very important for healing damaged muscle cells. So you, if you get an injury or you rip a muscle or a muscle cell, um, satellite cells oftentimes will go into the muscle, uh, become a new nucleus, and help repair that tissue. All right, so if you think about this, all right, so we have a muscle cell that's about, we'll say it's about this big, right? So it's obviously not the scale. And when you 
work out, when you exercise, when you stress this muscle cell and it becomes larger, which is that muscle hypertrophy, it's going to grow in cross-sectional area. When you get to this larger cross-sectional area, you now have more volume that you need to serve that needs to be maintained. Proteins need to be able to be made in order to um, create that volume and maintain that volume. All right, so that's a process that um, requires access to your DNA which is inside your nuclei. So if you go from a smaller cell to a larger cell and you have more volume that needs to be taken care of, you're gonna need more nuclei in order to get that genetic material there uh, in order to continually uh, build proteins and maintain or grow the cell for further. All right, so that is the job of a satellite cell. Again, the nuclei are essentially satellite cells that have already gone inside the cell and are already doing that. The satellite cells on the outside are essentially dormant cells that can come into the cell in order to become new nuclei to help um, maintain a, another area of, so a new myonuclear domain, so the area that it, that nuclei serves. So it's gonna create a new New myonuclear domain when the cell expands, so hypertrophies, or if the cell gets damaged and it needs to help out essentially to just fix and repair it. So this is the reason why, unlike most cells of the body, skeletal muscle is multinucleated. Right? Most cells have one nucleus, skeletal muscle have several because over time these satellite cells can go in and become new nuclei. All right, so very important for adaptation to injury, or following injury, or adaptation to resistance type training that is going to hypertrophy the cell. Let's uh, look at the individual muscle cells again um, and talk more about these myofilaments. All right, so these myofilaments are the proteins that make up the structure as well as the contraction, uh, contractile abilities of the cell come from them. All right, so again, the big ones are the actin, the purple, and the myosin, the green. All right, so if we looked at this very zoomed in version of this here, you can see the uh, actin, you can see the green again, the myosin, it's got the myosin heads there, which is the little knob looking things that can actually grab onto the actin and pull. Um, and you also have these red spiral spring, spring shaped uh, proteins called titan. All right, so the actin is essentially a rope, the myosin, the green, is the workhorse that it's going to grab onto that rope with those little knobs and pull so it's that's what causes the shortening or the contraction and the titan is going to kind of hold it all together all right so it holds on to the myosin and it attaches it to what's called the z line or z disc and it prevents the the sarcomere so if we go back for a second this from this here to this here is this whole length is one sarcomere, so one length of essentially contractile units. Um, so it's what holds the contractile unit or the sarcomere together. The, is the Titan does that. All right, so it prevents it from being overstretched. It has a recoil-like function. So if it um, needs to go back to its original resting position, it, it's uh, springy and um, just kind of elastic and it pulls everything back to where it's supposed to be and it prevents it from lengthening too much. If you um, look at this, again, this black and white uh, image here is an actual image, a electron mi micrograph of a sarcomere. So this is actually what it looks like if you zoom in with a very strong microscope. Um, and you notice these sort of lighter bands, these darker bands, and some different things going on here. So those all have different names. So Again, the sarcomere is from Z-line to Z-line. They're called Z-lines because if you look close enough, it kind of has like a jagged edge. It's a Z-like shape. And from Z-line to Z-line, again, one sarcomere, one contractile unit. If you come to this sort of dark area here, that's called the A-band. And then we have the M-line M in the very center, which is the this what's being depicted here. It's what kind of holds the myosin all in, in line with each other. And we have the I band, which goes across two sarcomeres. And here's another one here. And we have the H zone, which is this sort of lightened area in the center here. All right, so if we look at this depiction, this purple and green depiction up here, you notice that, so we have purple, so that means there's actin only, and that's essentially this uh, I band, so this lighter, uh, appear, appearing area here. We have the H zone in the center, which is green uh, only here in the depiction. 
or if you look at the actual H zone, you can see it's a little lighter around, around the M line. It's a little bit lighter than it is in these sections here. And then if you look at the areas where actin and myosin are actually overlapping each other, um, which is what we're seeing here, you can see th uh, in this depiction, purple and green together kind of makes this sort of tealish blue, dark blue color. All right, so, and that's, uh, again, this purple and green, this is artificial. This is uh, me just creating an image to kind of depict how you get this um, striation, because these are the striations. But in, under an electron micrograph, again, this real image down here, um, that overlap is going to prevent light from getting through. So these darker areas have overlapping um, myofilaments, so actin and myosin overlapping each other, preventing some of the light from shining through. Um, and so that's what makes them dark, where these areas here, where you only have the actin, actin's not going to prevent much light, so a lot more light's gonna shine through and it's gonna look brighter. Right? So that's what gives it this striated look, is whether there's overlap, or no overlap of the actin myosin. And um, this, these different bands and lines and zones or whatever else, um, that's all just created by whether or not there's actin and myosin or both present. Muscle cells are going to contract together. Okay, so you're not going to contract one muscle cell um, at a time. You're going to contract, contract sort of bundles of muscle cells or a collection of muscle cells. Um, so the contractile, um, the functional contractile unit is the motor unit. Okay, so the motor unit is the alpha motor neuron, which is the neuron that uh, is going to go into and innervate the skeletal muscle, causing it to contract, and all of the muscle cells it innervates. All right, so if this alpha motor neuron were to uh, be stimulated, and uh, an action potential were to be created that would go down the axon, ending at the uh, motor end plates that actually touch these muscle cells, then all of these muscle cells would contract together. All right, so again, if the alpha motor neuron it fires, all the muscle cells it uh, innervates is, are also going to fire. And this unit is called a motor unit. There is an order to where how we contract these muscle cells. So if you go back to the first part of this lecture on skeletal muscle, we talked about the different type of muscle fibers. So we have muscle uh, type 1 fibers, type 2A fibers, and type 2X fibers. All right, The type 1 fibers were the fatigue resistant, the smaller, weaker fibers. The type 2Xs are the larger, stronger, but more fatiguing fibers. They, they wear out quicker. And the type 2As are somewhere in between. All right, so, but if you notice again, they're different sizes. All right, so a type 1 fiber is small, a type 2X fiber is very large, and the type 2As are somewhere in between. So we have this neuron coming down, a single neuron that's going to interact with these three different uh, motor units. Okay, so this motor unit goes to all type 2X fibers. This motor unit goes to all type 2A fibers, and this motor unit goes to, so neuron or motor unit goes to all type 1 muscle fibers. All right, so the type of neuron that goes to the muscle cell determines the type of muscle cell it becomes. All right, so it's not the other way around. The muscle cells don't determine the, muscle, the neurons. The neurons tell the muscle cells what to do. So the neurons are the master of all the muscle cells they innervate. All right. So anyways, we have this single neuron coming down, interacting with these three different neurons um, that are all alpha motor neurons that go down, interact with their muscle cells. All right, so one motor unit, another motor unit, and a third motor unit. All right, the size principle is what determines how and when a muscle cell is going to uh, contract and be activated. And it's not so much the muscle cell that's important, it's the neuron that's important. All right, so a type one muscle fiber is a type one muscle fiber because the neuron that goes to it is basically a type one uh, neuron. All right, same thing with type two A's. They're essentially a type two A neuron. Type two X's are essentially a type two X neuron. All right, so the neuron controls the muscle cell, not the other way around. All right, so the neurons are like the muscle fibers where the type 1 muscle fibers are very small, so are type 1 neurons, and then the other end of the spectrum, type 2X muscle fibers are very large, and so are type 2X neurons. They're very large, they're very thick. All right, so if you have this single 
um, neuron that's going to interact with all three of these alpha motor neurons and it's going to release the same amount of acetylcholine on all three of them because they're all getting the same stimulation here so they're all getting the same neurotransmitter uh, volume that's interacting with it they're going to cause uh, the same amount of impact on each one of these the difference is because these are different sizes, the relative impact is going to be very different. Uh, a very small neuron getting a, a moderate amount of acetylcholine dumped on it is going to cause the activation of a lot of sodium channels. And it's going to have a huge impact on it. And it's probably going to cause this motor uh, neuron to activate and cause an action potential that will travel down eventually activating all of its muscle fibers. If it is a small to medium sized stimulus coming from this original neuron, it will probably activate the type 1 fibers and type 1 neurons, but it might not necessarily activate the type 2As or the type 2Xs. Right? Because these have a larger neuron associated with them, um, the same stimulus that was enough to activate this is going to sort of get drowned in here. So think about big pools of water, right? So if we have a little pool and you put a couple drips of like red food coloring into it, it's only going to change it a little bit. If you put that same couple drips into a little tiny pool, it's going to turn it bright red. Right, so that's essentially what's going on here. So we have a little tiny pool with a little bit of food coloring drop, dropped into it. It's going to completely change the color. In this analogy, that means activating the neuron. Up here, this larger neuron, you have a bigger pool. Now a couple of drips, the same couple of drips, same amount of red food coloring, isn't going to even make an impact. You're not even going to be able to see it in that pool, which means this isn't going to uh, activate the type 2X fiber. All right, so because this of this size principle that controls this the muscle fibers are going to activate in the order of type 1 fibers first then type 2a fibers second and then type 2x fibers last all right so if type 2x fibers are active and are contracting that means all three of the fiber types have to be active and contracting all at the same time all right so because the muscle one uh, type 1 muscle fibers are always going to be active if the type 2 A's are active and the type 2 A's are always going to be active if the type 2 X's are active all right but that's not the same the other way around smaller a smaller fiber can be active without a larger fiber but a larger fiber will not be activated without a smaller one because again we have these uh, different sizes of neurons they're going to get the same stimulus so the smallest ones can activate first the largest ones can activate last so if you are increasing the intensity of a contraction we're going to ramp up in intensity so again type 1 is going to activate then type 2s then type 2x uh, sorry type 2a then type 2 X's then when we go the opposite way when we slow down the contraction and create a weaker contraction we're going to produce less acetylcholine which is going to turn off the type 2 X's first then the type 2 A's second and then the type 1's third all right so we're going to ramp up starting from type 1's and then ramp down ending with type 1's so the type 1 fibers are always the first and last fibers activated type 2 X fibers are always the last fibers activated and the first ones to deactivate all right, because it's a ramping up and then a ramping down. All right, and the type 2As are in the middle. All right, so again, this is all controlled by the size of the neurons associated. So the size of the alpha motor neurons. A larger alpha motor neuron needs a greater stimulus to cause um, an action potential. A smaller alpha motor neuron needs a smaller stimulus. All right, so now we're going to talk about excitation-contraction coupling, which is uh, the connection between the electrical stimulus from the neuron and the actual contraction of the, um, the myofilaments in the sarcomeres shortening. All right, so the action potential is going to, going to be initiated in the brain that travels down the spinal cord, and it's going to depolarize the motor neurons, the alpha motor neurons, uh, associated with a specific muscle cell. So we had an action pendule coming down the neuron, releases acetylcholine in the space, the synaptic cleft, and that's going to potentially activate the, um, the muscle cell, causing another action potential to travel down the sarcolemma. And you have these little tunnels that they're, they're attached to the outside of the cell, so the sarcolemma, and they tunnel into the cell. Um, these tunnels are, are called transverse tubules. 
or T tubules. All right, so they bring the action potential. So the action potential travels down, it gets to a hole, it goes down that hole into the muscle cell, and it's going to cause the muscle cell um, to eventually contract. All right, so the way it does that, so that again, the, the electrical impulse travels down the T tubules, which butts up directly against the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, which contains all the calcium. It's going to then activate the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium inside the cell. And that release of calcium is going to bind to the troponin, um, which is, here is our, the purple is our actin. The troponin is these um, yellow circles. And we also have this thing called a tropomyosin, which is this yellowish goldish strand going along the actin. All right, so the calcium comes out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It binds to the troponin and it causes it to change its shape so it kind of curls in on itself and when it does that it pulls this tropomyosin with it all right so the troponin um, binds to calcium changes its shape and pulls on that tropomyosin moving it away from this resting position on the actin and it's going to expose um, an actin uh, myosin binding site all right, so if the tro tropomyosin isn't moved then myosin can't grab and pull it all right, so that's very important. So the act or the calcium is what causes that tropomyosin to actually be moved. So this is the excitation contraction coupling com going from a neuron having an, uh, a, an action potential down to a muscle cell having an action potential, eventually ending with calcium moving the tropomyosin uh, molecule. Now to the sliding filament theory. So we've gone through the action potential on the neuron and on the outside of the muscle cell. We have calcium now attached to the troponin molecule, moving the tropomyosin molecule out of the way, and our actin binding sites uh, for myosin are now exposed. All right, so. At rest, all of your myosin heads, so this, this green is the myosin, the purple is the actin, and this sort of golf club shaped thing here is the myosin head that does all the actual um, stroking motion that contracts the muscle. All right, so at rest, the myosin head is always gonna be bound to an ATP, that energy unit. All right, so it's a f intact ATP, so it hasn't been broken down for the energy to be released yet. All right, so at rest, it's bound to ATP, no force is being produced, there's no connection between the myosin head and the actin molecule. All right, so step two is we're gonna break down that ATP molecule. When we break down the ATP molecule, it's going to take that myosin head, it's gonna cock it straight, and it's gonna be held on, or oh, there's still gonna be um, ADP in the inorganic phosphate holding onto the myosin head, as you can see if you look closely there and we have no force that still has been produ produced yet. So again, we have our actin, if your myosin in a resting position with an ATP bound to it, it, the ATP breaks down, causes it to cock up and be ready to grab on. Um, when it grabs on, this is when the that inorganic phosphate is going to be released. All right, so the myosin head has now grabbed onto the site, the binding site on actin, the phosphate has been released. And right now, this is when you're producing force isometrically. So if you tried to push the muscle apart, it would resist that. Um, but you don't have any concentric force yet. So the muscle cell or the, the myosin hasn't pulled yet. It's just holding on. All right, so step four here is when you actually have the power stroke. So again, it's, it's like this. The power stroke is it pulling the actin towards it. So more like this. So actin, the myosin binds the actin pulls in, that's the power stroke, that is a single unit of contraction. All right, so at this point, the ADP is released from the myosin, and when another ATP attaches to it, it goes from this position, right? So again, it binds, it, it has the power stroke. When another ATP molecule attaches to this, it releases and is ready to do the cycle again. And it keeps doing that, keeps moving the actin along, and that is how muscle contraction happens. All right, so it's a cycling of myosin grabbing on, grabbing on, grabbing on, and pulling each time. So that is how muscle contraction actually happens.
All right, so now that we've talked about how the muscle contracts from a molecular mechanism perspective, um, let's talk about what actually controls how much force and the actual velocity of the contraction and what controls that. So the most obvious one is this first bullet point here, which is the type and the number of motor units recruited. All right, so remember a motor unit is an alpha motor neuron in all the muscle cells that it innervates. All right, so if you recruit more motor units, in other words, you activate more more motor units, then you're going to create more force. Right? That's pretty obvious, I think. Um, if you recruit more type 2 motor units versus more type 1 motor units, recruiting the type 2 motor units because they're stronger muscle fibers, it's going to produce more force and greater velocity as well. All right, so more motor units, more force, more type 2 motor units versus type 1, one uh, motor units, and that's uh, more force and more velocity. All right, so the other three... Uh, things that control how much force that you can produce are a little less obvious. Um, so we're going to go, well, we'll list them right now, then we'll go one at a time and talk about them in detail. All right, so first is the length tension relationship. So basically how extended the sarcomere is when you're trying to contract it. Um, the second is something called rate coding, which is how frequently the nervous, uh, the alpha motor neuron is stimulating the muscle cells. And then number four here is the force velocity relationship, which talks about how um, you can only produce so much force when you're going at a certain speed, or if you want to go faster, you have to decrease your force. And we'll get to that in just a second, though. All right, so let's first talk about the length tension relationship. All right, so. If you think of uh, any resistance movement that you've done before, there's usually different sticking points. Sticking points being the most difficult part of that movement. Um, usually if you're gonna fail to do the movement, it's gonna be one of the sticking points. All right, so um, looking at this bicep curl here, ignoring biomechanical advantages and disadvantages, um, just looking at it from a muscle perspective and specifically from the perspective of the sarcomere, your weakest points are going to be this first one when you're almost fully extended and this last one where you're almost fully contracted. The strongest point for, as far as the muscle is concerned, again, not looking at the biomechanics of the situation, is going to be in the middle of the movement. Typically, that's what it's going to be too. It's typically going to be the middle of the movement where you're going to have the greatest force production. And the reason for that is you have the ideal amount of actin and myosin overlap. All right, so when you're very extended like this, if you look at this uh, diagram here, again, the actin is the purple, the myosin is the green, um, and we have an entire sarcomere. So here's a Z line, here's another Z line, and uh, the M line in the center. All right, so when you are fully extended like this and you're trying to contract that muscle, only a little bit of the actin and the myosin are overlapping. All right, so what actually produces force is when a myosin head grabs onto actin and pulls. So every head that grabs onto the actin and pulls is essentially one unit of force. The more heads that are grabbing at one point in time, the more force you're gonna produce. So if you only have a little bit of myosin and actin overlap, that means that only a few number of myosin heads per sarcomere are gonna be able to grab onto the actin uh, filament and actually pull on it. So you're not gonna produce a lot of force. So that's why at the bottom of the movement, you're not producing much force. At the top of the, unit, uh, the movement, so the opposite end of the spectrum here, you have a lot of myosin and actin overlap. However, you get to a point where you have too much overlap. All right, so the actin um, and the myosin start hitting the ends of the sarcomere, so the actin starts going across, actually going across each other like this, so they're not really useful at that point once they've crossed each other. And the myosin actually starts to butt up against the Z lines, um, which causes a little bit of uh, force kind of pushing outward. Um, just We're talking very, very small amounts of force, but still. Um, so when it gets too small and the actin start to go past each other, they're no longer being actively grabbed grabbed and pulled on by that myosin, and so they stop being useful, uh, like I mentioned. And so, again, the more myosin and actin interaction you have, the greater the force production is going to be. So at the bottom of the movement, you had very little um, actin-myosin uh, interaction because there wasn't enough overlap. It was barely touching each other. At the top of the movement, they're past each other. They're actually moving past each other, so there's still very little um, actin-myosin connection happening. In the middle of the movement, you get this sort of optimal 
amount of actin and myosin overlap where you have as many as possible of the myosin heads being able to attach to actin at any one point in time. So again, here you're weak, here you're weak, in the middle of the movement. So when the muscle at, is at the middle of its range, that's when you're going to be the strongest from a sarcomere actin myosin perspective. Again, ignoring the biomechanics of this particular lift um, that would kind of go against that. But think about any lift you want. If it's a chest press, the middle of the movement is where you're gonna be the strongest, not the very top, not the very bottom. All right, so that's the length tension relationship. Rate coding is a little, uh, uh, it was very different. So with rate coding, first I need to explain to you um, a muscle twitch. So a single muscle twitch, which is what's being depicted here, is you have the, um, the neuron stimulating the muscle, that's here at zero milliseconds, so at the very beginning. Then you have this latent period, so it's about five milliseconds long, where you're essentially waiting for all those processes that we already talked about to take place. So you're waiting for the calcium to be released, you're waiting for the um, tropomyosin molecule to move out of the way, you're waiting for the actin uh, or the uh, myosin head to break down the ATP so it can grab on. All of that stuff is happening during this latent period. So at that point in time, there's no force production. After the latent period's over, you start to have this increase in force production that takes, it's different depending on the situation, depending on the muscle fiber type, but it's about 40, 40 milliseconds, we'll say. Once you get to your peak force production for that single muscle twitch, it starts to relax and then the force production comes down. All right, so we have this latent period followed by a contraction phase and then a relaxation phase. All right, so the um, contraction phase is a little bit faster than the relaxation phase, which is gonna be important um, in the next uh, slide that we show here. Um, but essentially these can build off of each other. So if we take this, so we here, this is a single muscle twitch. So one muscle twitch means one neural stimulus causing one little tiny contraction. If we look at this, so now we've shortened the time span. So our x-axis is a much longer period of time. So it's all scrunched together. Here are those same muscle twitches. So here's a muscle twitch, here's a muscle twitch, here's a muscle twitch, and there you can see them as uh, as they kind of go up and forth. So the reason why it's going up and forth is something called summation. All right, so here is your summation. So these little yellow lines here are your neural stimulation. So if you had a neural stimulation causing a muscle twitch, then it relaxes all the way down. Another neural stimulation causing a muscle twitch relaxes all the way down, and then another. Right here, what's happening is the neural stimulation is starting to get faster, if you look at the uh, laser pointer here. Or here, you're getting full relaxation before the next uh, neural stimulation comes. Here, the neural stimulation is too, short, too quick, that it's happening at a too high of a frequency for the muscle fiber to relax fully back to normal. And so what happens is it starts to build on each other. So you have a contraction, it starts to relax, and then boom, here comes another neural stimulation, it starts to uh, well, it contracts again, and now this is where it's summation because you're adding on top of each other, you're summing them up. All right, so each neural stimulation that comes before it gets to relax fully, it actually goes a little higher than what the previous one was, starts to relax a little higher, and the faster these neural stimulations happen, the less relaxation you're gonna have between um, twitches. And so, you again, you get the summation and if it's happening fast enough, like you see down here, very quick neural stimulation, you don't get any time for relaxation between switches. And so what happens is they build on each other to a point where they hit their maximum uh, force production, which is, again, forces on the y-axis here. And so you just get to this nice plateau, this nice steady contraction. So most of the time when you contract a muscle, you're reaching this nice steady state of contraction. We call this complete tetanus. All right, so tetanus is the basically the sum that I was talking about to the point where it's nice and smooth. Over here, where you get this little relaxation and con uh, contraction that's still happening back and forth, back and forth, that's incomplete tetanus. Incomplete tetanus. So, Tetanus is a nice smooth muscle contraction, a very fluid one, very coordinated muscle contraction. When you're lifting a weight and it's a little hard for you and your, sh your muscles are really shaking, 
that's incomplete tetanus. That's essentially what's happening. So you're not stimulating your muscle fibers. You don't have enough neural stimulation or neural frequency in order to cause that contraction to happen smoothly. And so it gets that sort of shakiness, which is contract, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax with each stimulus. If you were able to increase the frequency of your stimulus, um, you would lose that shakiness, which is why a lot of times uh, this happens to me with abs. Um, if I'm doing a crunch and I'm not warmed up, I'll shake a lot. Once I'm warmed up, the neural stimulation is uh, happening a little more fluidly, a little faster, a little uh, less time in between, I stop shaking. All right? So if you warm up sometimes, that the incomplete tetanus goes to complete tetanus. And again, that's just because you're increasing the rate of firing of those neurons, and um, so you don't have have that relaxation between firing. All right, so that's rate coding. So the faster the neuron fires, the stronger the force is going to be that uh, is produced from that uh, motor unit. All right, so the last uh, point here that I want to talk about is the force velocity relationship. All right, so think about this from a functional standpoint. If I were to tell you to lift this super heavy weight that you can barely move, you're not going to move very quick. You might be able to lift it, but you're not going to be able to move very quick. Vice versa, if I want you to move faster, I need to lighten that load a little bit. So uh, force and velocity are inverse to each other. You can only go so fast with a heavy movement, and it's not very fast at all. Um, but if I want you to go faster, I just lighten the movement, and now you can go faster. All right, so to explain why that is, so why you can't move both forcefully and fast at the same time, it's because of the number of mice and heads that are grabbing on any one point in time. So if you're doing a very high force lift, which is what's being depicted in this top diagram here, you have a lot of your mice and heads that are attached to the actin. All right, so the vast majority of your mice and heads are attached. So again, remember, each time a mice and head grabs onto actin and pulls, that's essentially one unit of force. If you have 10 of those happening, you have 10 units of force. If you only have five of those happening, you only have five units of force. So if you want a lot of force to, um, to occur, so you're trying to produce a lot of force, you need a lot of myosin to be attached to actin all at the same time. All right, so the more that are attached, the more force you produce. And that's what's happening with a very uh, heavy lift. All right, you're attaching lots of myosin heads to the actin, and they're all pulling at the same time, and they're doing this so very slowly, because remember, each each pull is only a really tiny microscopic movement. So if they're all pulling in unison, and then they have to sort of cycle and let go and grab and pull in unison again, you're gonna move the weight, but you're gonna move really, really slowly. Think about uh, like a tug of war match. If your team is going like this and pulling, letting go, pulling, you're gonna have a lot of force if you're all pulling at the same time. But if you wanna move faster, let's say you were way stronger than the other team, instead of grabbing and pulling, you can kind of cycle your hands, right? And so that cycling is gonna make the rope move a lot faster. However, you can't produce as much force because you're not holding on with both hands at the same time. And that's essentially what happens with uh, needing to increase the velocity, you have to lower the weight, and so you can do that. And so if you look at this bottom diagram, a lot fewer of these myosin heads are actually attached to the actin at any one point in time, which means more of them are cycling and pulling onto that rope, which is the actin. So again, High force movement, all the mice and heads pulling together in unison, producing lots of force, but not moving a whole lot with each pull. With uh, high velocity movement, you have to let go of more of the mice and heads and you have to cycle them faster. And that cycling is what makes it very quick, but it's also the reason why it can't be very strong. All right, so that ends the skeletal muscle section. That was part two, part one. Again, we went over some basic information as well as fiber typing. Part two, we went over a lot of the more in-depth anatomy, how muscle contracts from uh, a more of a molecular standpoint, a sort of microscopic standpoint. And so if you have any questions on any of this, you can feel free to put comments down in the comment section below and I'll try to get back to you. Otherwise, please come back and watch another video. Thanks.